Um, but today for our, this is a perfect uh, intro, today for our uh, part two, we will go ahead and discuss uh, what did you learn in your first year as a national patient safety investigation body? Uh, so as I mentioned, we have our speakers that were here for part one with us here today. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce them in just one moment, but for the folks who are just joining us now, welcome. It's really good to see everybody from different parts of the world. Um, we are going to go ahead and record here today. We will send out this recording to everybody who registered as well as to the PFPS network. So good to see everyone. Please share it amongst your teams and you know, if anybody else has any questions or would like to see future webinars, you know, please let us know. We'd love to hear more about that. Um, so as you can see, we have folks here from the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch in England. We have folks from the Safety Investigation Authority in Finland and the Norwegian Healthcare Investigation Board in Norway. So if we go to the next slide, um, I'll, I will go ahead and jump into our objectives here today, and then we'll go into some introductions. Um, so we would, uh, we're going to be touching on questions related to comparing the first year lessons learned across several national patient safety investigation bodies. We'll be discussing sort of their theories and key performance metrics and how they developed their first strategic plan. And really for us here in the States, as we're looking to emulate in certain steps uh, from, from these uh, oversight bodies, um, we're looking to identify key lessons learned uh, from, from their first year in business, essentially, so that we can apply it as we're moving forward in the U.S. and and in many other countries with similar uh, investigation bodies. So uh, with that, I will go ahead and introduce myself. It's wonderful to see everybody. My name is Olivia Lounsbury. I am currently co-chairing uh, the National Patient Safety Oversight Committee at the pa uh, Patients for Patient Safety US with Marty Hatley. Um, in my sort of full-time role, I'm working in uh, uh, quality safety and quality and safety research, you know, in a bunch, a bunch of different institutions um, around the world. But really, I'm coming to this space uh, as an AML leukemia survivor, and so that's really where I uh, come into the patient advocacy space, and I'm just very excited to, to see you all here today on the same journey. Um, so, Marty, I'll pass it over to you to introduce yourself, and then I can introduce everyone else. Um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are, uh, or good evening. Uh, I'm Marty Hatley. I'm in the United States. I'm a longtime patient safety advocate. I'm a founding member of PFPS US uh, with um, wonderful colleagues, many of whom are here today. Uh, we have a long history of being um, patient safety advocates. We now uh, think of ourselves as patient safety activists because we're impatient for change. We've been being good partners for 20 years and uh, haven't seen the progress we want to see. So that's who I am. I'm also the president and CEO of Project Patient Care, which is a um, small nonprofit organization in Chicago that does improvement work, trying to bring the voice of the patient the lived experience of patients and families into um, patient safety work uh, um, in the United States. So thanks, Olivia. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, thanks. What? Okay. Oh, <clears throat> are, are you going to do more introductions or is it time for me to do my stuff? Uh, yes, I'm happy to go ahead and introduce our speakers here today. Okay. I I have their information in front of me, but I know that this definitely doesn't do it justice. I feel like we could write a book about the accomplishments and contributions of each of them, but I'll go ahead and get started and, and try to do my best. Um, so we're joined first here uh, by Rosie Bennyworth from the Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch in England. Um, Rosie joined HSIB in August 2022 as chief investigator, and she has a longstanding interest in improving the quality and safety of care that people receive. She joined us from Care Quality Commission, or CQC, where she was Chief Inspector of Primary Medical Services and Integrated Care, with a responsibility for regulation of a portfolio of services across many community sectors, introducing the regulation of the integrated care systems, or ICSs, and leading thematic work such as the review uh, into do not attempt cardiopulmonary resuscitation decisions during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Rosie was a GP in Somerset for 15 years and during that time also worked as clinical commissioner in the Somerset Primary Care Trust and clinical commissioning group, commissioning a wide spectrum of services across the county. She was also the managing director of the Southwest Academic Health Science Network, deputy chair of the National AHSN Network, and led the patient safety collaborative work during that time. She was a non-executive director and vice chair of the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence between 2016 and 2019, and is currently a trustee of the Nuffield Trust and the National Children's Orchestras of Great Britain. Rosie, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Excellent. And next up, um, we have uh, Dr. Hannah Tarinke 
Hannah joined uh, the Safety Investigation Authority Finland as the Chief Safety Investigator of Social and Health Care in June of 2021. She was responsible for leading and developing social and health care investigations and has earned her PhD in health science from the University of Oulu in 2014. She holds the title of docent, our associate professor in the field of health and well-being services at the University of Lapland. She acts as professor of practice at the University of Turku in the field of social and healthcare safety. And she has over 80 publications related to social and healthcare systems with research aiming at increasing the understanding of health and social care system quality, effectiveness, safety, and integration. In addition, she is a trained occupational therapist and a qualified teacher. Prior to starting at her current job at SIAF, she acted as a senior specialist at the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare in issues of patient and client safety, quality registers and service packages, and chains in health and social care. Hannah, welcome. We're really glad to have you. Thank you, Olivia. It's nice to be here. And last but not least, we are joined by Sonova. Sonova is Head of Relations, Learning and Quality Improvement at the Norwegian Healthcare Investigation Board. She has been working in the Investigation Board since the very beginning of 2018 and is responsible for the development of the healthcare investigation method and processes, the board's internal education program, and ensuring that the board's reports and recommendations are conveyed in a way that is useful for recipients. Sonova has a political science degree from the University of Bergen, she has worked as a researcher at Uni Research Rokan Center in Bergen at the University of Stavanger in the field of societal safety. She has published more than 10 scientific articles on homeland security, and in addition has an education and experience in improvement methodology and implementation science through the Nordic Improvement Agent Education and through IHI's Improvement Coach Program. Before she started her current role in the investigation board, she led the work of implementing the Norwegian National Patient Safety Program titled In Safe Hands 24-7 in the Western Norway Regional Health Authority. Sonova, I'm so excited to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Really glad to be part of this webinar. Excellent. Alrighty, and for everyone just joining, we are recording, and if you are just joining, please go ahead and mute your mics, and I will turn it over to Marty to kick us off with a summary of similar efforts here in the United States. Great. Thank you, Livia. Before I do that, I just want to join you in welcoming Sonova, Hannah, and Rosie. Um, I just had the chance to uh, go to Finland and Norway and meet Sonova and Hannah in person and uh, learn from their, them and their teams about what they're doing, and it's going to really help us shape what we're doing here in the United States. And I just have to thank you, Olivia, for doing all the heavy lifting and putting this together while I was traipsing around Scandinavia, having a wonderful time meeting inspiring and wonderful people like Hannah and Sonova. So I really appreciate that. And I think we've got people from um, the Jewish Healthcare Foundation here today too, Karen Feinstein and others who uh, made that trip possible. So I wanna thank them. Um, and now I've got to figure out how to move the slides. So I wanted to share this slide, uh, which is um, a depiction from the National Patient Safety Board Coalition and the organizations that are supporting it about why we need an agency like this, like they have in UK, um, Norway, and Finland here in the United States. We have all these different agencies, all these different sectors that are doing something on patient safety, but they're not coordinated at all. And, they, and patient safety really has no home. We fall between the cracks as all these different groups try to do something on patient safety, often without, without much coordination, certainly from our point of view. The thing <clears throat> that we hear most from patients and families when we talk to them is they don't know where to go when they have a patient safety concern. They don't know where to report. They don't know who to talk to. They don't know where to get resources. It is just a fractured, fractured ecosystem. And I think this picture begins <clears throat> to, to, to lay out just the, the, the fractured nature of what we're dealing with here. So the goal for us here in the United States really has been to get a home for patient safety, someplace where uh, people know to go and people have trust, can generate trust in, in knowing that there's something happening. So the good news is that there's been a coalition. Again, it's been supported by um, Jewish Healthcare Foundation through its Pittsburgh Regional Healthcare Initiative for several years now. And, um, and they've developed a, um, uh, working with members of Congress, a piece of legislation that was introduced last December by a Democrat um, congressperson named Berrigan uh, from California 
to establish a national patient safety board here in the United States. And this board would be an independent agency. It would have board members that are, are appointed by our president and confirmed by our Senate. Um, it, it will, it, its scope of work really is to uh, do studies about patient safety um, problems and then make recommendations in a non-punitive, non-regulatory way to different parts of that ecosystem that might be able to do something about it. Um, there's been a lot of um, effort on the part of this coalition to, to make this and position this correctly, I believe, as a nonpartisan issue. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, which are our two major parties here in the United States, uh, you're at risk for unsafe care. And that's a message that I think has been very effectively conveyed. What I know we're working on now, because we're looking at reintroduction of this bill later this summer, is, is really nurturing that Republican support, the support from both parties, so that we can you know, display this uh, nonpartisan approach or bipartisan approach here in our country. The other thing that um, I think has been really important for us as, from the patient safety community, from the patients and family community, is to ensure that there is really uh, the lived experience of patients and families who have suffered harm, experienced harm events that were preventable in every aspect of this organization. So we, we, we want very much to be represented at the board level uh, where the chief policies are made. And we, there's also an expert team that will be responsible for doing the investigations. Um, and we wanna be uh, um, represented there as well. So there is dialogue going on. Uh, you can find the bill uh, online by going to npsb.org. Uh, Olivia, you might put that in the chat if you have a moment to do it. That's the coalition website and you can get access to the bill there, but just know the bill will be reintroduced this summer with some changes. The other thing to note is that we have um, the interest of our, of our president, uh, Joe Biden, in this issue. And Sue Sheridan is, uh, I think, probably the only person here today who's been part of a working group um, um, that is making recommendations to the president mm -hmm. about what he can do in his executive leadership role to, um, to improve safety. And um, so I know we can't say too much about it, but certainly there's been recommendations from many people that are part of this coalition and this community to see a National Patient Safety Board be part of that constellation of things that the president will consider doing. So we're waiting on that too. I mean, that may impact how this moves forward. We, we have really two tracks in this country. It can be a legislative track where our Congress would act to establish this, or it could also be done, um, at least hypothetically, by an executive order. So that's kind of where we are. We, we expect to, be, to see movement on both the executive order front and the reintroduction of this bill uh, yet this summer. So with that said, I think... Um, we're ready, Olivia, to start the conversation we want to have with our uh, leaders today from the UK, Norway, and Finland. Excellent. Do you want to sort of jump into this first, and then maybe we trade questions that we want to pose to our esteemed guests? I think that sounds like a good plan. Um, so just to kind of give everyone a little bit of context, I mentioned this earlier, we had a part one of this webinar about six months ago or so, really just to level set how each of these uh, uh, investigation bodies function, you know, uh, uh, as a whole. And so today we're really diving into what were the lessons learned in their first year of business? Essentially, what do they wish they knew as they were going into the first year with the doors open here today? And one of the questions we were all really keen to start out with is, you know, amid the healthcare landscape that is um, oftentimes, you know, highly competitive and, and we really have to define our, our roles and, and we have to make sure that we're balancing, you know, our independence with collaboration with the hospitals and healthcare organizations involved, you know, and, and maybe, um, Hannah, I could direct this question to you first. Um, how did you establish a balance between independence and collaboration in your first year? What did that look like for you all? Thank you. And thank you, Marty, about this introduction. From, from USA perspective also. Um, that's uh, the balance uh, between different different uh, author authorities and different actors uh, in healthcare sector and between us in safety investigation authority in Finland is it's very big and very hard question. And um, because the independence and objectivity are the main pieces of healthcare safety investigation and uh, the same, um, same understanding about our work and of others' work, 
it has been needed uh, a lot of discussion, lots of uh, information, uh, lots of this different kind of cooperation with other other authorities that we can we can um, create mandate for our work. So creating balance, you asked Olivia about the balance. So it has been needed a deep and active discussion with different kind of uh, uh, actors. Also working life, uh, physicians, nurses in a, in a, in a um, basic, basic uh, level of healthcare, but also with the Ministry of Health and, uh, Health and uh, Welfare, uh, with other authorities who are steering um, or evaluating um, safety and uh, quality of healthcare. So I think the first year, and now I have been two years in this position here in SAIAF, Safety Investigation Authority of Finland. It has been every week uh, quite many uh, meetings or discussions about our work. It's, it's like uh, uh, speaking out and uh, speaking out and writing, writing out what we are doing and what is our our mandate and what is our focus because there is a misunderstanding about safety investigation and the quite normal question is for me that what why why you are doing the same that some others are doing but the, there is no one else who is doing the same and I think that's one point in USA as well. There is many, many authorities who have own mandate to do something for patient safety, but there is no that kind of authority who is doing safety investigation, which is which is our work. So, but it's not easy to easy to understand any, everywhere, and there is lots of um, uh, different kind of attitudes, maybe fear also for against uh, safety investigation. Are we are we steering uh, or looking for um, um, just justice or, or liability, or or uh, who is who is taking care about the mistakes or or um, incidents in healthcare? But that's not the point. We have the same goal with other authorities to increase patient safety, and I think that that will that will meet, that will need uh discussion in the future as well and i think the strength strengthening and and the power comes when we are uh, um, sharing our learnings from different countries hannah if i if i may one of the things that really struck karen me and the rest of our team when we met with you in finland was the way in which your organization is is your home is the Ministry of Justice. It's not the Ministry yeah. of Health. So you you collaborate with the Ministry of Health um, in many ways, but there's also a think tank there. And maybe think tank isn't the right word, but I'm thinking about the Center for um, Patient and Client Safety, which seems to be a resource for, um, for both the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Justice, and also had done mm -hmm. interesting work in really connecting your plan, your country's plan, Finland's plan, mm -hmm with WHO's Global Patient Safety mm. Action Plan. That was very impressive. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think that's maybe, uh, I think we are maybe the only country where healthcare safety investigation uh, is located to under the Ministry of Justice. And there, there is a tradition for safety investigation in Finland because, because um, all the transportation and other accidents uh, investigation has been under the Ministry of Justice. So it was quite um, um, quite simple to put uh, healthcare safety investigation action in the same organization. And I think that's good uh, choice because there is also issues that we are uh, looking um, from the point of view of, of Ministry of Health. And our recommendations quite often goes to the Ministry of Health. And well, that makes my my work easier than I, I'm my home home base is in uh, under the Ministry of Justice. But there has been lots of questions why this is so. And of course, from Ministry of Health and the, from the healthcare uh, sector, there has been uh, questions why Ministry of Justice is coming to to uh, 
look after the, the errors in, in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, uh, that, that easy. There is a complex questions, but that has been working. What made sense to me, and I know we need to move, move here, Olivia, to our other speakers, but what made sense to me is the fact that by placing your work in the Ministry of Justice, they already had a, a mechanism in staff, frankly. Yeah, that that's true. Yeah. Knew how to do investigations. So you got to, you kind of hit the deck running with people that not only knew how to do investigations, but knew how to um, to communicate with patients and families, which was yeah, really that's true. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And I would like to add shortly about the WHO's um, patient safety action plan. That has, that's very important also for us in in the SIAF, but the mandate to to coordinate and implement implemented it in Finland is is in the uh, Ministry of Health. So that's natural, but that makes also a pressure for us to make uh, also a cooperation and active collaboration for patient safety, because we have the same goal anyway. Okay, thanks, Anna. Olivia, Thank I, you. I kind of stepped into your your space here. <clears throat> No, I thought it was very helpful, and and these probing questions might, um, you know, lengthen the the uh, duration of this webinar. But I'll try and keep it under control. But Rosie, I'd love to hear from you too. You know, in terms of both, how did you balance independence with collaboration? And you know, similar to what we're discussing here, how did you navigate and sort of establish role clarity with your organization and and the number of other organizations that are kind of tangentially related? Yeah. So. Um... I don't think they're mutually exclusive independence and collaboration. I think that you need both um, and it is finding that balance and we're still on that journey, finding that balance um, a few years into um, our journey. I, I think probably a mistake we made early on as an organisation was to um, make ourselves too independent and, and kind of um, hold independence as the most important thing at the expense of collaboration. And I think... Um, as a result of that, I don't think the organisation firstly heard from stakeholders about where they should be investigating. And, and so some of the investigations that the organisation started with sometimes were seen as a bit nuanced and people couldn't really understand why they were being done always. Um, and then I think also at the other end of the investigation, I think that um, the independence meant that often the um, stakeholders weren't really bought into the recommendations. They they didn't really have the impact that we wanted them to have. So we've been doing quite a lot of work and uh, on how we change that. Um, and we're aiming for a much more collaborative model right at the beginning of the pathway so that actually we work with stakeholders to really understand where the major patient, patient safety risks are, as well as looking at um, patient uh, feedback, patient uh, experience uh, data as well, um, but also um, then looking at much more collaboration. You know, how do we how do we actually um, collaborate with the organisations that we're going to make recommendations to? Not to change the recommendations because it's really important that we have the independence around being able to say what we want to say and, and need to say about the system, but to make sure that those recommendations are kind of um, implementable, for want of a better word that they can actually happen and um and also then to collaborate around how we land the recommendations so that they really have as much impact as possible the way we do our investigations the um what we do and and how we do that is very much it's it's our responsibility and we need to have no interference in that that needs to be completely independent um, we are being set up as a new organisation in the UK. So we, as I mentioned last time, we're moving from an organisation that has been sat within NHS England, um, which is the major delivery organisation uh, of care in, in, in the UK, to, um, to something called the Health Service Safety Investigation Body, which is going to be an arm's length body of the government and with its own board. And that will mean that we will have far more independence in the system. And I think that will give us a much stronger voice around safety in the system. So I think it's it's a, it's an interesting question in terms of where you put that balance. And I think you need both to be effective. Um, and I think we're still um, testing where that is. Another change we're having with our legislation um, in October is that the Secretary of State can direct us as to what 
we can investigate. And we've just had our first uh, commission from the Secretary of State around mental health investigations, which are going to be starting in October. So again, there's that, um, that dimension to independence. Um, so we're not fully independent in terms of deciding what we investigate. We can, we can use our resources as we see fit, but we will also have this um, ability for the Secretary of State to direct us. Um, and um, just in terms of how we're working with the rest of the organisations, I think, you know, people talk a lot about patient safety landscape being very crowded. And in, in the UK, you've got um, you've got uh, the NHS England team, I've got a patient safety team, we've got a patient safety commissioner who's looking at um, uh, uh, particularly safety around drugs and, and medical devices. We've got... Um, all of the regulatory bodies, so the Care Quality Commission, the professional regulators, um, and a number of other kind of players in patient safety. And we, we think um, whilst all of those organisations have got their own distinct role, actually as a patient or a family member trying to navigate through that, it's quite complex and um, quite confusing to where you should go with, with what. So we've started to work across all of the leadership of those bodies to say, actually, how do we start to make sure that we're effective working together um, as national organisations? And I think part of the things we want to look at with that is firstly, how do we how do we make it easier for patients and families to navigate the system? Secondly, how do we start to look at the recommendations that we're putting out into the system so that they they, they're not duplicative or even worse still they're not conflicting which can which can create all sorts of problems in the system um, and so we've got a lot of work to do I think because it is a, a muddled landscape but I think um, we're, we're on the way to we're, we're having lots of conversations about that which is good. Olivia you're, you're muted. On mute. Thank you so much, Rosie. That was incredibly helpful. And just having been here for not even a year, I can only imagine how complex the landscape is to navigate, but I'm really excited to hear the great work that you're doing. And Sonova, I wonder if, you know, quickly, you know, you might be able to sort of summarize your experience and, you know, does it resonate or is it congruent with the experience that Hannah and Rosie are having in their respective areas? Yes, absolutely. I It does resonate and I, I agree and I I recognize the, the challenges that they, they draw for us. I think it's a bit, well, Rosie said that maybe the HSIB did the mistake of making themselves too independent in the start. I think it's, it's a bit tempting for me to say that the mistake we perhaps did was to take our independence for granted. So I'll come back to that. But I, I guess the, the, to make this balance between independence and collaboration, I think uh, conversations is a key word. Uh, and during our first year, and, and actually we still do, we, we spend a lot of time and resources on traveling around, visiting health institutions, patients and next of kin organization, expert groups and academic organizations and so on, and talking about, you know, our mission and, and start conversation with these different actors and how, how our work can be useful for patient safety and for health personnel, their safety as well. And in these conversations, we are know very clear about our independence and then and, and what that that means and uh, we in Norway we decide a hundred percent for ourselves which cases to go into but of course we are not um, we are not expert we are not subject matter expert we are first of all um, investigators and hence we need to work closely together with both health personnel and experts and and patients or experts by experience, as we learned when Marty and his team was visiting us. And we have to talk, you know, to those who know where the shoe pinches, so to speak. And yeah, this balance is a really fine line and, and to establish and maintain it, uh, this balance, it is very important to always be aware of our role, which is to investigate, write reports, make recommendations. And when we have completed a rec an investigation, it, it it can be tempting kind of to join um, uh, the public debate that might come in the aftermath or, or to, to be a part of improvement work or, you know, the work of my, making new guidelines for this and that. But it is really important to keep in mind what is our mission, which is to investigate and provide new knowledge on pace, patient safety issues and not to take part in this 
based or improvement work, because if we do that, we, we run the risk of not being neutral in a later investigation on the subject. So, so this, uh, this balance is, is really important. So, oh, that's interesting. But if, if, I'm sorry, Olivia, but I just want to jump on this point, because one of the things that I was really impressed with, that I think all, all of us were who met with your team, Sanova, is mm -hmm. the way you sort of uh, maintain balance through your investigation process by interviewing every stakeholder, starting with the patients and family, and, and then ending with the patients and families before your reports go public. But the goal, as I understood it, was to make sure that no one was surprised when the report came out, that everybody felt like they were heard, even if they might disagree or have some issues yeah. with the recommendations, you, you were able to kind of document that you talked to everybody and got their point of view and weighed it. And, you know, I know that's a lengthy process. I know you want to be doing more reports than you did, but but your 17 reports in four years struck me as quite an accomplishment given how careful the balance that process was. Yes, yes, uh, I, I agree. And, and, and that process takes time. Yeah. It does. Mm. And I, it, yes, it's, it's, it's true, uh, your uh, description of, of, of it. And it yeah. has to. Yeah. And speaking from the just the patient advocate point of view, I, I was just so happy to know that you started with the patient and then ended with the patient. We heard something similar from Hannah. I see you nodding your head <laughs> in Finland as well. Um, Olivia, we may not get through all of our questions today. I know I'm, I'm taking more time than you planned, but you know, I think we're ready to kind of move into the next one. So why don't I do that? And what we'd really like to, to start a, a little bit of discussion about now is how you decided what to study. So what criteria did you use? What priorities did you use? Rosie, you've kind of already brought us into this conversation by saying the commission is giving you some things to study, but uh, why don't we start with you, Sonova, on this and just, you know, your 17 reports, where did, what, what was the genesis of those reports? How did you decide to study what you did? Um, I, <laughs> I, I, um, I'm not sure. I, I wish I could say that we kind of did a really, you know, uh, thoroughly work identifying the biggest patient safety risk uh, at our onset. Um, but to be honest, we, I'm not sure that we actually did that because in in our first year or, or in our you know early days, the question is actually is where do we start? <laughs> um, so we did not have a big database in 2019. Uh, which we have now, or it's, it's not it's not huge, but it's you know six thousand cases approximately. But we did have some knowledge on patient safety issues through uh, the Norwegian uh, the data from the Norwegian uh, Global Trigger Tool work. So that typically data on falls, um, medication errors, uh, infections, and and so on. But the thing is that those areas are actually very well covered by the national patient safety initiatives. But there are many um, dark or gray areas that are not covered by the patient safety program. So, so what we did again was actually to start conversations, talk to patient user group, health personnel leaders, experts, and so on. And also we established what we call a reflection panel, um, but you know, a panel of our critical friends to help us give us direction because uh, because of our independence, uh, we don't have a board um, that can direct us and uh, nobody can direct us. So therefore we are kind of anxious to lose contact with uh, the, the real world uh, out there. And, and to avoid this, we, we established this, this reflection panel so to help us you know, prioritize uh, uh, our mission. And in addition, uh, in our early days, and highly inspired by the early work of the HSIB, we developed a set of um, selection criteria for selecting our cases. And the first versions of these were really, really um, detailed, uh, making sure that we selected case, cases with learning potential, system risk, and, and serious, the most serious cases, as we have gained more experiences. And we have a bigger database that allows us to monitor the situation better. Um, our, these selection criteria have evolved, so to speak, and they are not so detailed anymore. Um, but that, 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 that's our journey, I would say. 
I was impressed by the way in which you are open to reports from patients about individual events, for example, or even from media stories about a risk that might emerge there first. And I was also impressed that you were taking on some controversial issues uh, and, and really working on those. Um, so it just seems like you cast the net kind of wide for what, what might, might be prioritized to investigate. Yeah, I think that's correct. And, and you know, um, so it's the health services that, you know, our law covers, but, you know, people's health depends on a lot of things outside the health services. Uh, the educational system, uh, the social the social care system, um, the society actually. So, so we that's true, Marty. We we cast on it fairly wide. Yeah. Hanno, can you weigh in here? Your criteria, your selection criteria. What's sort of been the genesis of the things that that um, uh, SIF has, SAIF has investigated? Yeah, thanks, Marty. Uh, then I heard soon of a story about how how they make criteria what to investigate. The story is quite the same in Finland. There is not like hundred percent platform what cases are coming in or what are going out, but there is a, a lot of similarities with uh, Norwegian system uh, how we identified and how we identify uh, the cases, what what we might be investigated and, and what are not. We have, in Finland, we have a legislation of safety investigation and there are some, some uh, main points like um, um, what, we, what we shall investigate, but that's not um, just the same in, in, in healthcare. Uh, as it as it is in, for example, transportation, but um, and we don't have in Finland that kind of uh, database where is all the serious uh, cases in healthcare. It's kind of well, it's like kind of Sherlock Holmes, <laughs> you know, work uh, to find those cases, uh, what are potential to to investigate and and and. By investigation to to get some some um, uh, effectiveness for for patient safety in in whole field. Uh, so, well, two first years in my job has been um, not systematic because there is plenty of harm in in healthcare, and uh, we get information some place or some some other not. So. We have started with those cases which has been in our limit to investigate. And I think now when I look back, we have uh, we have made right decisions. Our investigations has been uh, important and they have give uh, uh, excellent uh, recommendations and the uh, field of health healthcare has welcomed our work. But there is not uh, that kind of guideline uh, what to investigate or what not. We know uh, never event cases, for example. So that's clear. Of course, that gives the frame frame for for that process, uh, how to what to investigate. But I think in Finland uh, we are also working uh, with the legislation with uh, this database and uh, and um, um, that when something something harm happens. There is, uh, you have to inform it to authorities, but that's not not, not that clear today. Yeah, Anna. One of the things that I liked about um, your criteria, such as it is, is that um, you know even if it's an individual case that you're looking at, you look at whether it could trigger, be a trigger or a signal to a, a, a bigger harm that could, could that was a bigger risk that could impact a lot of people and. So Nova, I heard that in, in your in your um, briefings as well. And Hannah, so Nova, I just have to say, uh, we don't have access to big data here either. That's one of the hopes for our mm. industry is that we will bring big databases in so we could do better analytics there. But the fact that you were open to individual reports, I think uh, is also very, it, it speaks to, to what we hope will happen here as well. 
Olivia, I'm going to pitch this back to you now to kind of take us into our, our next area of inquiry here because time is flying. Absolutely. Um, so I know that we have about 20 minutes left and I can already see that there are a number of questions in the chat and I can also sort of speculate that this may not be the last time that we come together as a group uh, with, with these folks because I know that there's a lot of shared learning happening you know, uh, mutually. Um, so I will you know, jump over one of the questions we originally had planned today, which was around our you know, how did we develop the strategic plan for the first year? We will save that in case we invite this group back uh, in, the, in the very near future to discuss. But, you know, I really want to hear from the three of you before we go into Q&A. So, you know, I, I'm kind of hinting at everybody, you know, we will get there. We'll save some time for that. So please put your questions in the chat or be ready to unmute and, and ask some of those questions. But before we do, you know, if you had any advice for yourself, if you had any advice for your younger self as you were starting, what would it be and why? Rosie, do you want to jump in first? Um, yes, and I I wasn't at the start of the organisation. I, I I've only been at the organisation since August. Um, but I think um, I think what the organisation has done really well is to be. Um, uh, to, to look at the best kind of investigation methodology and to be really clear about the investigation methodology that's being used and um, and to, to kind of use um, our, our teams use a, I'm, I'm not an investigator, I'm not an expert, but they use a, a variety of methods to actually investigate um, different areas. So I think it, it is important to make sure that you've got good methodology uh, from day one. And actually, I think also it's um, it's important to think about the how you quality assure that um, those processes and how you quality assure the reports before they go out. We've got very well developed um, QA processes now, but I think that that inevitably took some time to um, uh, to get out. I think the second thing is I think um, it's really important to spend the time raising the visibility across stakeholders about who you are and what you do and what your role is in the system. We get, um, and I, I see there's a question in the chat about uh, media in the UK, and I'm very happy to, to talk about that, but we, re we regularly get called a regulator or watchdog in the, mediator, in the media, and we have to... Um, uh, frequently say actually we're not a regulator we're not a watchdog um, and uh, we have to um, work through that so I think raising visibility so people understand the exact role we have in the system is really important and I think the third thing that I would say is that I think it's important right from day one to think about what happens to the recommendations um, that you make as an organization I think how you have um we, we, we're not a regulator, so we don't have the teeth of a regulator, but how you make sure the recommendations are impactful and have the most impact on patient safety and think about how that how you look at that impact. I think we have had impact um, across the, um, the NHS in England. Um, I think some of that impact takes a while to actually um, become visible. And I think um, uh, I, I think we've um, historically put out our recommendations, waited for the response from organizations three months later, and then that's been the last um, the last of, of what we've done. I'm really keen that we actually use that information a lot more to get out the learning into the system. Also really think about how long we, we kind of follow up. And I know that's where we're very different than Finland who long follow up recommendations and follow up work for a lot longer. And I think that's something I've, I'm really keen to learn from fin Finland about how they do that. Excellent. Rosie, thank you so much. And I, I appreciate kind of the tangible, actionable pointers there. And, you know, I just want to direct everyone's attention to the chat and, and you know, emphasize how, you know, well developed the, the reports are and easy to use and understandable for, for a broad audience. So thank you, Rosie, for the work you're doing there. Hannah, can I pick on you next with the same question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I have four tips for you. So first of all, um, you should plan very carefully your communication plan to be sure enough that um, people are knowing what you're doing and what is safety investigation and what is the role of safety investigation in healthcare. And that communication took a lot of resource, resources, as we heard also from Nor Norway and, and England. It's uh, hard work to because you also have to do that safety investigation, that, that uh, main work 
it's like extra all the time to to meet uh, different kind of actors. That's very important because without that clear communication about our work, we don't we cannot uh, change also the meaning of of safety investigation in healthcare. And secondly, be sure that you have a talented experts. You need experts from the field of healthcare, but you need also experts of safety investigation. And that's one thing what we can we can share also in the national international networks that we can we can create together the expertiness expertiveness of our safety investigation, like methodology uh, of of healthcare investigations. Then, uh, thirdly be prepared for uh, critical feedback <laughs> and stand behind what what you have done i have learned this now uh, during these two years that there is a lot of critical feedback and critical uh, attitudes for safety investigation and and maybe that's one re one reason is that i come from um, under the ministry of justice that that makes some some fear uh, fear atmosphere when I come come in the room. But but uh, also the safety investigation is not always a happy report for everybody. So if you, if you like to change something, everybody is not happy. But but I'm sure everybody understands that uh, things have to change that we can we can increase our patient safety. And then the recommendation, uh, um, Rosie mentioned about the recommendation. I think that's one of the most important thing. Be uh, prepare very carefully how you will follow up the recommendations and what is that process. And I'm, I, I can I can share our experience from Finland in some other webinar about the follow up how we do it in Finland. <clears throat> And I would be very excited about that one. My wheels are kind of turning for that next webinar about, you know, how how do you sort of develop these recommendations so that they stick, communicate them effectively, and then and then follow up to, to make sure that they were, you know, implemented or, or adapted. So I think that's excellent. Thank you. So Nova, last but not least, same question. Yes, very short. I, I totally agree with Hannah's and Rosie's um, uh, tips and guides, but I just wanted to add that in, in Norway, there is no follow up of the recommendations. So that's, uh, so, uh, that, that's something that we, we, we would wish there, there were, and, and we are really interesting, interested in learning more uh, of that. So I'm, I'm looking forward to our next webinar <laughs> on that issue. But just to, just to add a, short, a little bit of, of what Hannah said, uh, it, because it, I think it turns out that an independent investigation board is quite a radical idea. And, um, you know, an in independent board not pointing its fingers at single health personnel or single institution, but pointing at, you know, frame conditions, perhaps provided by other state agencies and the political level. And we find that some of this, these other state institutions find our activity a bit annoying, perhaps. And uh, we are, sometimes feel that we are a little bit like the little child in, in the, the fable of Hans Christian Andersen's the, the Emperor's New Clothes, the child who piped up, but he has nothing on. And the Emperor sometimes find that a bit annoying. Uh, but on the other hand it, hand, it could be a big relief to them, to the servants and the people. But um, I think that's an, uh, uh, something that we have kind of learned um, or a, an advice that we maybe should be more aware of at the starting point. So Nova, that says to me that you're making a difference. <clears throat> when, when we look at our National Transportation Safety Board here, most of the recommendations don't go to transportation industry, they go to the regulators about how you can better or you know exercise oversight and you know you are going to make people uncomfortable that's that's change happening so i applaud that even though i'm sure it's difficult it sounds like hannah's grown a thicker skin too from some of the <laughs> criticisms that she's she's taken in olivia we have a lot of questions here so i think it is time to break and i hear sonova already saying that she's up for another uh round of this uh perhaps later in the year after summer holidays in europe but 
Um, well, let's let's move into Q and A. We've got a couple of hands raised, and then there's some really interesting things in the in the chat. Um, Nagwa, your hand's been up for a while. Do you want to ask a question? Nagwa is a um, uh, an accomplished patient safety advocate in Egypt. Nagwa, we cannot hear you. You are on mute. Maybe I can unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, actually, from the what I have been listening to all this very very impressive uh, experiences, I think um, I can say that um, from my point of view, the word of investigation it's a little bit hard, and this is will be one of the blockage and one of the challenges which we will face. If we change the word of investigation to another things, maybe it would be things much more easier. Because investigation, it means punishment, it means many other things which people won't like it. The second thing, I like very much the idea of uh, no guidelines. Uh, because if you put the guidelines, it means that you are excluding some of the medical errors and you are taking some of the medical errors. So I'm very much uh, in the idea of take everything without guidelines so we can have uh, more, uh, we'll be more um, objective yes. about our work. The other thing is, uh, if I'm doing, I hope I can do this in my country, but it's a bit difficult because we have a syndicate. I don't know if you have a syndicate in your countries or no. We have a medical syndicate, which they do sometimes an investigation. So there will be a clash between the investigation who are doing and the investigation which they are doing. But from your experience, I can conclude that uh, cooperation is one of the very, very important part in the investigation, if you call it investigation the communication and the work and the passion to serve the patient and the mutual benefit between all the parts that they should be known to everyone. This is will make all, will make all the work much more easier. But in the end, it's not, a, it's not an easy target. Uh, maybe it will take time because no one will convince that some other bodies will do investigation of something which uh, the, the Ministry of Justice or the Ministry of Health or the syndicate or everyone are doing so. And then you come, you come up from nowhere as a patient champion or something like that and to do all this job, it's not easy, but it's very important. But yeah. cooperation will make these things very much easier. Thank you. Not, well, one of the um, <clears throat> one of the tensions that you mentioned we have in the United States. So we are not using the word investigation in our legislation because of yeah. the, it doesn't mean punishment, by the way. But that's yeah. the way people hear it. They hear it, they hear it as it's going to be punitive or whatever. And really, what it is, it's fact finding. It's trying to get to the heart of the problem so that we can make a difference. So we're yes. calling it studies. We're calling it analyses. I mean, we're using different terminology and kind of. Um, I, I'm personally cutting my tongue about that, but it, it is what we're doing. Um, we do have, um, Ohana, you want us to respond? Thank you. I just want to say to Nagma, and thanks for your comment, uh, that maybe I was a little, a little bit too pessimistic or negative. <laughs> the investigation work is also fantastic for work and very interesting, and uh, it gives a lot. And, um, in, in SIAF in Finland, Finnish Safety Investigation Authority, there, there is aviation and railroad and marine investigation, and they have the same uh, they have the same problems. They are facing the same kind of attitudes, and they are facing the same kind of uh, uh, hardness. Also, investigation in in that field. So I think the investigation work is similar actually in in, in aviation. Healthcare is not not that. Uh, specific, even it's for us very specific. 
but there are same kind of uh, learnings and same kind of uh, um, uh, problems and just we go together together uh, forward and we can learn also from the other other um, investigation branches like like transportation. Thanks. Thanks we have um, just about five minutes left, and um, Olivia, I see two sort of areas in the in the chat that people want to explore. One is, what are your agencies doing to advance transparency? Evan Benjamin's raised a question about a duty of candor, honest, open and honest communication. <clears throat> and then we also have a question about health equity. I mean, we have such disparate outcomes in our country between different groups of populations, and it, it has to be a priority for us. I'm wondering if it's been a priority in your countries as well. You may not have the disparity in outcomes that we have between different kinds of people. Rosie, I see you nodding. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, so on the second point, absolutely. We have got widening health inequalities, um, which I think everyone is concerned about. And um, I'm really keen, and part of the work I want to do as we start in our new organisation is to start to think about how do we really understand those through the investigation process and how do we really understand the impact um, on patient safety. I think we're seeing increasing examples of where um, patient safety um, uh, where risks are actually far more um, enhanced in uh, high areas of deprivation, in certain ethnic minority groups, in um, in, in certain groups uh, with protected characteristics. And I think we really need to understand that and understand how we can influence that through our investigation work. Um, I also think that we under need to understand potential subconscious bias in investigation approaches um, and understand um, what impact that might have as well. Um, and I think it's an area that we don't fully understand at the moment, but um, especially in our education function out to local organizations who are doing um, investigations. Um, I think, for example, we know that uh, black and minority ethnic um, doctors in the UK are more likely to be referred to professional regulators uh, following investigations locally. And I think we need to really understand that and, and support um, that understanding so that um, we don't let, uh, we, we minimise subconscious um, bias in those investigations. In terms of openness and transparency, we're very keen uh, as we set up HSSIB to be as open and transparent with our work as possible. We've got, we will have all of our public uh, board meetings in public. Um, we are having an interesting conversation, which might not be uh, for now, but something uh, that is emerging in our new legislation around protected disclosure and what's called safe space, uh, so that we don't disclose uh, the interviews and the information that people interviewed by us uh, are, are telling us. So that's probably longer conversation than now, but I think it is important that we, um, uh, it, that's going to be an important thing for our new legislation that we'll need to work through. Rosie, we're, uh, and Olivia, I know you're, we're at the end of our hour, but I did want to say that one of the things that was a, that was surprising to, to me in Norway and Finland is the way in which, through their investigation process, they might have to be um, de-identified or careful in their official recommendations, but because they engage patients and families, they can tell them more of the facts uh, in the investigation that, you know, may not be made public, but, but people have a right to know, and I was so happy to hear that. I don't know if that's if you're finding that there too, but it 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 respected. I think the question that Evan is talking about is people deserve to know. And we hear we hear that a lot with our maternity investigations, where we individual uh, investigate individual cases. Um, and there's this, uh, you know, there's a lot we need to do in that space because we still hear patient stories where things, especially in local investigations, have have seemed to be covered up or not that people haven't had that transparency and openness in the investigation process. So I think there's a big cultural uh, shift we need to make. Olivia, we are at time, Olivia. So I know you wanted to, to um, launch a survey. Do you want to say something about that? 
Yes, absolutely. And I'll go ahead and, and close this out too. First with a very, very big thank you to Rosie and Hannah and Sonova for joining us here today um, and for really you know putting a lot of work into the preparation for the questions to ask. We had to hone in on some of the most impactful ones and we know that there's a lot more out there. So um, we'll certainly be in touch, you know, potentially as we're uh, coordinating future events. Um, I want to say thank you to all of the, the folks who attended too, um, you know, asking the questions and really generating this conversation. I saw a lot of folks also in social media right before this. Um, so thank you so much for giving us your, your thoughts and sort of energy and, and curiosity around this topic. And, you know, please, as a next step, um, you know, kind of direct that into the survey I just put in the chat so that we can plan um, our next events based on what would be most impactful for you all. And then last but not least, I'll say thank you to Marty for, you know, co-facilitating and, and really developing, um, hopefully, what was an an impactful event. So uh, just as some last minute housekeeping, um, you can see that we are recording. We will send this out to everybody that registered. You have the survey here in the chat. Um, if there were any questions that we didn't get to in the chat, we will take them into consideration, copy paste them so that we can uh, incorporate them into future events. Um, and everyone, thank you so much for being here today. We will see you very shortly. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Great to see you all. Okay, I will stop recording. Maybe we can debrief a, a bit uh, with our panelists.